What I wanted to do was maybe just give people a few minutes to turn to our neighbor and, and talk to some friends. I do see a couple of hands in the audience, but maybe just um, take five minutes and get some of your thoughts out, and then I see the two hands that I've already seen. I'll come back to you. Security, and we were, seemed like we were good buddies. But the next day we went in, he came up to us and he said, Aren't you the two that I just kicked out? And we thought he was joking. And we're looking at him, and he's serious, he's got that serious look on his face. And, uh, Are you serious? Yeah. I just kicked you guys out five minutes ago. No. We just got here. Mistaken it didn't. Uh, and still to this, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what uh, he was actually talking to us like that, especially when he was supposed to be like, he thought he was a good friend. <laughs> that's security. So that's all I've got to share with um, Mistaken and the idea of um, people being marked as a uh, Someone else that uh, was probably going shopping and ruined their day by being falsely accused by someone else. So I, I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Les, for sharing that. And I think that's Les's story. Um, that's true, that happens to a lot of low income and indigenous and racialized residents of the Dantani side when they enter these spaces where they're followed by security guards. The other day I went to King's Gate Mall with two of my homeless friends and we were followed by two security guards for 45 minutes. We were asked five times if we were doing okay. We were just trying to get a phone plan, you know? But this is happening in the shops here in the Dantani side as well and it's a really big problem. And it's uh, racial profiling as well. To make it, some people I don't know they've experienced it before, but think about the way you feel when you cross the border, <laughs> the, way they, the way they look at you and accuse you and make you feel make you feel like you've done something even though you haven't. But that, that feeling to me is uh, the closest thing I think. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel good to be uh, looked down on like that or to be yeah. Um, do you want to come up and use the microphone? Do you want to come up to your little table? Maybe I don't want to Okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the panelists for all your interesting work and presentations. Um, I just want to talk a bit about um, the Chinese community and um, Chinatown specifically, but also on the downtown east side. Um, we know Chinatown historically has been a place of exclusion where um, still a lot of people that live there uh, don't speak English. Um, and because of that, even to the present day, we see them being excluded out of processes, meetings such as this, even though there's translation. And I don't know the outreach that went into the Chinese community, but there's not a lot of unilingual or monolingual or Chinese people that don't speak English here. So um, I think my question is how will we how will the strategy and even developing these strategies and getting feedback look at ways to include people that don't speak English in a way that's genuine and in a way that encourages equal participation to everyone else? Because we know that current strategies that go to the general population excludes a lot of people. So. I just talk about Kevin. <laughs> you, you want to talk about Kevin? Uh, okay, <laughs> then I get to talk about you. Oh, I'm certainly encouraged to see, uh, like, there is, I mean, and, and, and your problem, your, what you bring up has been an ongoing problem. Uh, and it's refreshing, certainly, to see that new, young generation, the 
Kwa Foundation, the Youth Collaborative for Chinatown, uh, and the other group with King Mon, and like, uh, there's, there are great efforts and strides being made to uh, rectify that, and I, I think maybe, uh, are there still city staff here? Like senior planning staff? I think maybe we need to start throwing a little bit more money their way, and actually start engaging them, because they're doing a fine job, and I think they need that kind of support. And um, let's encourage and nurture this new young generation of Chinese Canadians that are that are hoping to, to, to help the elders and to really sort of make that happen. <laughs> Just to get it straight, you're suggesting that you that we give planning more money? Or the planning give them? No, sorry, the planning give Yeah. <laughs> that's right here, because we're right Both good ideas. Yes. I think that's really important to support the groups in the community who are working on this, but I also think the government and the city should take responsibility for that as well, because a lot of time that work falls on community groups to fill in those kind of gaps. And so, translation, that, I think that's something the city should do for all their community planning events in the development site. Well, I mean, on that note, I mean, you contacted me, or someone I mean, you were working with contacted me early last year and talked about the translation, the idea of like translation gear. And uh, we were able to go and get these headsets that we're using here tonight was because of, of you guys bringing that up. So, I mean, if you guys have ideas, you know, uh, just continue to push us to try and try new things out, to do a better job on the translation front and the inclusion. But that's just a, recent, a small but recent example of like uh, something we did because we had uh, suggestions from the community about something that could be improved. So these headsets are pretty happy to be used here in the community. Um, yeah, and, and just part of our engagement work, uh, we're still learning as an organization along with a lot of our community group allies on like the processes and the knowledge uh, gaps. Simply because, uh, like even for translations, uh, thank you Wilson, uh, a lot of the terms and nomenclature, uh, including like some of our environmentally more focused uh, initiatives, uh, we have to consistently work with our partners to figure out what is it that word in Chinese does it actually capture the nuance? Uh, are there knowledge gaps? So, for example, uh, a lot of our parents' generation might not have the ecosystem approach to biology. So, when we talk about say pesticide use uh, and, and spreading. Does that mean as much to them as it means to us with uh, certain types of knowledge? So it's not just a straight translation. I think there needs to be uh, more interpretive as well as uh, education and outreach in terms of trying to get everybody to have an informed uh, decision moving forward. Thanks. I know uh, for myself, when I joined the Retail Gentrification and Social Inclusion Working Group of CSAC, I spent a lot of time just trying to decipher the um, fairly technical terminology for a, a couple meetings there. So um, there was another hand here, and then Hendrick, you're next. Yeah. Do you want to come and please the microphone? Do you want to stay here? I'm yeah, we've got a lot of questions. So I'd, I'd like to also uh, focus in on Chinatown, and probably appropriate thing is by where we are. I find myself in a bit of a dilemma about Chinatown because as much as I would personally love Chinatown, every single store to remain 100% owned and run by Chinese-speaking people and serving Chinese products, and I lived in Taiwan for four years, I'm very familiar and comfortable with that culture. Um, and there was a, a very interesting major essay in the National Post recently by Douglas Kwan in which he talks about the death of Chinatowns throughout North America. And uh, if you just if you look at the, the, the BD project, for example, very near here, highly controversial, I think we're in a very different kind of time in history now, in, in history, economic pressures, where, where the, the force of multiculturalism is so powerful that there's a feeling that that kind of, that kind of exclusive ethnicity is no longer appropriate. And the people are not comfortable with it. At least half of, it seems to me, the majority of Chinese business interests are in fact in the favor of the, uh, of the BD development. Uh, if you look at the website Chinese VIA, the Merchants Association, we're in a very, very different kind of place for history than we were 50 years ago when Chinatown came together to fight the freeway, for example. So, comment from any of the panelists. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, I'm Taiwanese. Uh, immigrated in my lifetime when I was very young. So, uh, Chinatown is actually, I see it as more of an adopted history. And in terms of the multicultural uh, agenda brought in by Trudeau Senior, uh, I actually don't like it very much now that I've been doing a lot of racial justice work, simply because it, uh, 
has systemically erased a lot of uh, Chinese Canadian and other minority contributions. Uh, and growing up here, I'm well aware of uh, how Chinese Canadian contributions were limited to the two pages in the Socialist Pen textbook around how John and McDonald said, sure, let's uh, bring over Chinese because it's cheap labor. And then if you think about the long history of uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese head tax, and a lot of the uh, economic-based uh, food um, exclusions uh, that we uh, primarily focus on, um, that doesn't allow a lot of our youth to be proud of where we came from because the public narrative has been uh, kind of just like forcing us to be Canadian and proud of that, but not uh, recognizing our more um, traditional heritage background. Um, so I think it's, yes, the times are different. And even for my own personal journey, uh, it's, I grew up super white and I'll admit it. Uh, but it's now that I'm realizing the system that I was raised in here in Vancouver uh, really didn't allow me to be proud of my Taiwanese heritage. And I see Chinatown as a part of that. So how do we fight for uh, maintaining the cultural identity that's unique um, here and has meaning for people in their own ways of expression? <laughs> I'll just add that I, uh, over the last year and a half, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting quite a few new Chinese Canadian immigrants from mainland China, and and, and they did uh, counter counter to conventional wisdom. A lot of people say, oh, well, they, they you know they prefer the Chinatown in Richmond, and it's new and it's modern, and it's got big malls and stuff like that. But there's a growing awareness among new Chinese Canadians that. Our Chinatown here represents uh, a sense of place and pioneers, and that, that Chinese people were here just as long as the white people were here. Uh, they, you know, helped build this city just as you know they have just as much right. And it's there's a there there is a notion of pride there. There is a historical sense that uh, you know they came here uh, onto this First Nations territory uh, at the very same time as 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 the rest of the colonials and and that they have every right to be here. So I think it's important to recognize that part of our history, because uh, it is our history. It's not just their history or any one person's history. It's a collective history. It's a sense of place. Uh, and of course, we can't just keep everything the status quo. But we do need to recognize that this is a predominantly low-income community as well. And we can't just allow it to be erased and, 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 and not consider where people are going to go. Because it's not just about Chinese seniors. It's about all sorts of low-income people that benefit from those same shops and services. And, and, and they, they exist because they're filling a, a not just a, a Chinese-speaking person's wants and needs, but obviously a low-income people's wants and needs. And we need to recognize that if we lose all those uh, and, we don't, and we fail to protect it, that where are people going to go? This has been the last stand. This particular neighborhood has been the last stand for a lot of low-income people. I grew up in Vancouver. I remember when Kitsilano was all hippies and weirdy beardies and school buses and stuff and watched it turn Everything about Vancouver has changed to the point that this is the last little stand. Uh, so we need to recognize that context as well. It's really important. Yeah, to the to the to the question. I guess one of the things that I lie awake in bed at night worrying about as a community economic development planner is that culture is irrelevant to uh, a global real estate market unless it is. Uh, immediately part of the um, brand or the profitability, uh, the potential of that site in that context. And so um, Vancouver is not the only city facing pressures, but I think we're facing it more acutely than, than many. And so the annihilation of local culture by a homogenous type of, whether it's architecture or whether it is chain stores or whether whatever it might be, um, that's a powerful you know, process underway globally in cities as uh, real estate, this circuit of capital, uh, you know, has continues with low interest rates and everything else that factors in, con continues to be one of the ways that investors feel most confident uh, moving their money around on the global chessboard. And so how do we as communities and local government, you know, push back to ensure that we have some control over that when such incredible forces are at play? Uh, and I think that you know one of the things we need to grapple with is is a very nuanced um, identity that small businesses play as both villains and uh, victims in the gentrification 
uh, narrative. Uh, on one hand, you have the affordable local serving grocery store. On the other hand, you have the super expensive, non necessarily local serving grocery store. Uh, and a business can be, on one hand, doing something to perhaps accelerate gentrification, and on another hand, doing something that is actually doing some good in the community. So there, there's a lot of um, uh, murky territory here, but one thing is very clear, I think it comes back to the local ownership piece again. Chinatown is the way it is because local communities, clans, societies, families came together, bought and invested in places, maintained them, and still to this day are fighting to maintain them. Uh, we have the, the Legacy Building Rehabilitation uh, Program, which um, staff, you know, or the city are working and engaging the societies on. Uh, it's so important to, to maintain that local ownership uh, because uh, otherwise the local culture is irrelevant to a faceless global corporation that's developing in Palm Beach, Vancouver, Dubai, and wherever else. So, bit of a tie right there, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to come up or get, is your voice loud enough? You can use this one. I don't know why I can hear you. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, these uh, surveys were done uh, by people and businesses that are housed. There's a tremendous amount of trade taking place on the streets of Vancouver, and it's essential to the economy. Me as a low income resident, I do most of my sheep shopping on the street. And the stuff that's being sold out there, and the people that are selling it, um, they serve a very important function in society because it's a lot of most of the material that's sold is stuff that's being thrown out or used in movie sets. Like you find brand new materials, and they don't need it. You know, a lot of money goes into the movie sets, or it's donated to the street people. And the markets that we have uh, designated for that trade are not sufficient. It's not large enough. There's trade on the streets every day, every hour of the day and the night. You know, it is like any big city lives at night, so let's not lose uh, the perspective of the forest for the trees. There's a lot of underground stuff happens in the forest, you know, a lot of connections and, and recycling. So uh, maybe just make a note on that. Um, Hendrik, thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's something that I wish we would have talked about more. Uh, and I think that's something that came out through our community consultation and research as well, that one of the only places where you actually can buy things that are affordable for a dollar, fifty cents, or two dollars, or whatever, it's on the street. But it's become harder to buy things on the street because of the criminalization of survival street vending. And so there are these new spaces, a 62 is tasting, and through a 5 Powell Street, and that's all good, and they should be there. Um, but they're not big enough, and the space around Powell Street is not accessible to all low-income residents. The immensely popular Pigeon Park Street Market was closed down a few months ago. Uh, but also, when those places are closed, like they close at 5 or 6 p.m. in the evening, people still need to sell stuff, and people still need to buy stuff, but they're... Uh, constantly harassed by the police and if they don't move the police say that they're going to take away all their belongings and they do that on a daily basis in the Anthony side and uh, it's a criminalization of survival like that's what it is and people are just trying to survive so i think that should be a really important part of a community economic development strategy if we want to support the people who are homeless and people on the streets and on low incomes is to support those <laughs> members in sanctioned spaces or on the street. It shouldn't matter. Hi, I'm Amy from Boco. Um, we just started some research with the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. And we're looking at particularly uh, vacant spaces on the south end of Grapple Street, kind of the 800 block through just past AB. And uh, there is a sense, it hasn't, we just started the research, so don't have any findings yet, but there's a sense that, um, you know, the commercial real estate market is part of the speculative real estate market, of course, and that uh, landlords and leasing agents are holding spaces, um, you know, hoping to drive up the prices or win the chain store. And uh, so I'm just wondering, it sounds like Chinatown market, it sounds like maybe that's happening there, but I just wondered if you talk to landowners or leasing agents and if you hear that happening anywhere in, uh, in these areas as well. 
Um, well, there's certainly a huge amount of land assembly going on in the eastern end of the downtown east side. I'm probably not comfortable naming names because you might have somebody here. But, but big land assembly is happening in, in the eastern side of the downtown east side, and it is affecting a lot of the industrially zoned areas because uh, the speculation about his speculation is that he's hoping to clear out a lot of the kind of industrial use and, and integrate new kind of uh, the tech companies, now that tech is considered industrial, and in the process sort of just create a whole new tech district. Uh, and this is a, a great cause of concern for a lot of the sort of, you know, traditional uh, dirty industry type things that, you know, traditionally existed, you know, like the ball bearings companies and the, the boiler makers and all those kind of guys. So that's certainly a, a cause of concern for that kind of level of, of, of speculation in the area, um, considering that we don't have that much industrial zone in land and it's quickly eroding. Um, but I, and I also, it just reminded me of something that I had heard from a lot of people too, was that uh, there's a desire from some of the businesses to maybe see a little bit more, flex this is kind of off on a tangent, but more flexibility from uh, the city. So for instance, we heard stories about people who had like commissary type businesses and in order to do, even working with like, you know, helping some mom who wanted to, you know, Salvadorian mom who wanted to make papusas or something like that in a commissary, it became onerous because of the restrictive zoning and because the city wasn't nimble and fast moving enough to recognize uh, how we can make these kind of things happen in, in a more timely manner uh, because they just get mired in red tape. And there's a ton of businesses in the neighborhood who are mired in red tape. They're paying rent on empty spaces. I can think of a couple off the top of my head. They're paying rent on spaces and waiting for permits to get through. So we need to really expedite those kind of processes, get field permits out there so that we have city inspectors that are moving things along fast, so we're not sitting with vacant spaces and we're actually waiting on permits. Um, so just on that note, we recently sort of soft launched a new, what's called the Commercial Renovations Center at the city, because we heard for years and years that small business permits were getting lumped in with whatever, you know, uh, West Bank or awning or whoever was doing and so you want to get an awning or you want to get a, a patio or whatever it is you have to wait for you know 800,000 square feet of whatever to come through first so we've now um, that's that's been separated out and that commercial renovation center uh, is there to, to do that permit facilitation work so that small businesses aren't burning through cash waiting for smaller development permits stuff like that so um, they just um, yeah, they're just doing, they're just testing it right now, rolling it out, and uh, we'll be working with the BIAs and others to, to spread more word about that. But that is a new development directly in response to what you're saying. I just wanted to comment the one, what you said about the industrial lands. The And I encourage you, if you're concerned about what's happening in the industrial lands, to come to the open house, which is on the February 4th. Uh, because the intent is not to change the zoning to allow tech companies to occupy the spaces. Um, in some cases, there are companies that do design work and they prototype. If they're manufacturing something and, and they're, they're doing that kind of work, there are certain provisions in there, but the intent of the, the strategy is to protect it for industrial uses, recognizing the fact that there are some non-conforming businesses in there that blur those lines a little bit. But if you're concerned that tech companies are going to be um, you know, uh, inappropriate in tenanting uh, industrial spaces, come and share those concerns at that open house. Uh, but the intent of the policy is to protect it for industrial. Can I ask you to clarify how that policy might be different from what's happening in, in Mount Pleasant? Where so the they're two different. They're the rail town and Mount Pleasant uh, update guidelines are very different. And in, in, in Mount Pleasant, uh, I do believe that you know it, it, it is to try and accommodate a little bit more of the tech. Whereas uh, in, the, in the, the case of rail town, that area, it is more about the, the nitty gritty. We're close to the port, you know. Uh, different sort of um, concern about the type of businesses there. So you're seeing they're two, they're not the same policy, they're not the same updates that are happening. Mount Pleasant is a little bit different than what's happening in Railtown. Phoenix, and then I have one last question via Tanya Fink that I'll wrap up with. Please. I guess the question that I have for the panel is just to say again how urgent what's going on in the downtown east side is and that people are under a lot of pressure and getting pushed out. And while we do all these feasibility studies and 
research, things are changing as the research is being done, and I wanted to know what's being done to address the urgency. We heard from a Chinese gentleman how the Chinese grandmothers would be making dumplings in the back of the Chinese restaurants, and they're getting priced out, so by the time a lot of this gets put into effect, it may be too late for many people and many businesses, so what's being done to address that? Kevin, you want to do this? So, you know, I, I tried to note this in my, in my, uh, I was just trying to take the heat off me. I was trying to note this earlier in the presentation slides where it's like, yes, we're doing research and that stuff moves more slowly than investment in the community. Um, so the three proper programmatic responses that I listed, uh, I think are, uh, and mo most importantly, the partnership with BC Housing and Van City Community Foundation, because that's taking existing sites that are here right now, uh, and it has potential to include other ones. Now we have this community research, albeit it takes months for it to, for it to, to unfold and to be analyzed, but now we have, um, you know, three different s sets of community research that are uh, informing what that, that partnership can and should do, uh, as well as further advocacy uh, around uh, income supports here in the neighborhood, how that relates to small business, which we need to, you know, it's great to have data that unfortunately supports, you know, the, the reality of that. So I hear you loud and clear, and I, I do think that, that if we want an immediate response in terms of retail, that partnership, that serious partnership between BC Housing, Van City, and the city, that is the most immediate mitigation response we can take right now. The policy stuff takes time, take because every time you change a policy, it's like a spider web. All these other policies, all these other departments, you know, uh, are potentially affected by that. But a programmatic response like this has far more flexibility to, to move forward. Can I hear some questions? So, um, so just building off of that, as someone who is facilitating for the uh, retail gentrification and social inclusion working group of the CED strategy. Um, after this meeting, after this event we're having tonight, we're meeting again in about a month. And um, one thing that I'd like to do with that group is try to, to sort of distill and document some of what we've heard tonight and the really rich discussions we've had about the intersection of culture and economics and poverty and um, into some sort of a, a guiding principles for retail in the downtown east side. I think uh, something that can be done now is to have more of a cohesive voice around what type of um, retail should be in this neighborhood, low income serving, culturally appropriate. So um, I think if we, if I can respond, I think I would say if we have sort of a, a statement or something that we can share, then we can actually bring that to businesses, to developers, to, like I think that would help to create some cohesion. Um, because the, the, so, I'll pass it to Kevin and then you can riff on both questions. But the question that Tanya uh, shared with me before leaving tonight, she had to go to a board meeting, um, was uh, where where is the business community here tonight? So when we saw the hands in the room, there were a lot of residents of the community and a lot of uh, people who work in the community. But when I asked about um, how many people are business owners, so we you know we have some work to do in activating, I think, our networks and, and uh, Figuring out the right way to um, to get not just the BIAs who represent the businesses, but the individual business owners, um, because the, yeah, the BIAs have done quite a bit of work. But. So, um, if, uh, in closing, um, after you can, if anyone tells, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.